I'm Judea Murray, and here on a positive note, we highlight the most heartwarming stories from all around our tri-state that move and inspire us. Now, this first story means a lot to me because it's a reminder that having the right people in our lives can make a world of a difference. A Bridgeport woman says depression during the pandemic almost took her 11-year-old from her. But you're watching on a positive note, so you know there has to be a silver lining. Let's take a look. I like comedy TV shows and I like music. 11-year-old Josiah Torres, at first glance, looks like any other fifth grader, hanging out with his mom on a rainy Sunday and playing video games. But stay and talk for a while and you might be surprised by what you learn. My name is Minerva Roman and my 11-year-old son tried to take his life. It happened four months into the pandemic. I grabbed him and I held him and I cried. Her middle child, who has autism and is famous for his big smile, tried to commit suicide, she says, and very nearly succeeded. I couldn't go out. I couldn't see my friends. I couldn't go to my friends anymore. I just couldn't do anything. When I saw him, you know, so, so much in pain, I just, I didn't know what to do. So many kids are taking their lives. I, I cried uh, for maybe two weeks. It's just, I, I would go in the room at nighttime and I would look at him just to make sure he's okay. I hid everything in this house that he can harm himself with. Everything was just gone. But eight months later, thanks to aggressive intervention, Roman says, by Josiah's family, church, and community, her son has never been happier. Recently kicking off an initiative called Josiah's Helping Hands, preparing and passing out care packages for people who are homeless. Just stay positive and try to live your best life. Senator Richard Blumenthal meeting with the family to talk about depression among kids caused by the pandemic. I so admire Minerva Roman and her son Josiah for sharing this powerful story that will help a lot of other people. He's my everything. He's come such a long way. I'm very proud of him. This mom says she learned a powerful lesson, but it is one that nearly cost her son his life. My hope for all this is for other kids to, to open up to their parents and if they're feeling a certain way, depressed, sad, just speak to someone because sometimes having that extra ear to listen to really makes a difference. And that brings us to today's Did You Know? Did you know April is National Autism Acceptance Month? And it dates all the way back to 1970. See, back then, the Autism Society was working on getting national recognition to make sure anyone with autism could have a high quality of life. By 1972, organizers managed to launch a whole awareness week that would eventually expand to the month that we have today. And as of last month, the society traded the word awareness for acceptance, because as the CEO of the Autism Society of America put it, as many individuals and families affected by autism know, Acceptance is often one of the biggest barriers defining and developing a strong support system. So this year, the theme for Autism Acceptance Month is Celebrate Differences. And in order to celebrate those differences, it's important to first dispel the myths and misconceptions attached to autism. So News 12 anchor Asia McKenzie spoke to Donna Murray from Autism Speaks to help us debunk them. There's a saying in autism that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Donna Murray, Vice President of Clinical Programs at Autism Speaks, says that's because it's a spectrum. People have different experiences with autism, and so they present with very different strengths and challenges and needs and desires and aspirations. And there are many myths about autism, and Murray believes that stems from a limited view set and encourages people to broaden theirs. Research shows that early intervention support uh, better outcomes in the long term. Right now, the average age of diagnosis is around four. Um, and we really would like to get that earlier because we want to get families into intervention. And parents can seek out intervention before a diagnosis if there are some concerns. And some of the early signs can show up as young as 18 months. And Murray says those signs could be limited or unusual eye contact, not using gestures, difficulty playing with peers, or repetitive behavior. Really trying to get that help early is super important. While you're going through that process, there's no need to wait to seek help. Check out the Numbers and Links tab on News12.com for more info on autism and early intervention. Now over in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, there are some pretty extraordinary kids giving a helping hand to those in need. <laughs> These kids are making prosthetic hands. 
The Flying Classroom STEM program put this project together for the little engineers. Before this, they were building helicopters. Now the trick is they can only use the items that come in these little toolboxes that they were given. So that includes popsicle sticks, straws, and rubber bands. It encourages creativity in problem solving. Many times children are able to be out in the street and they're solving little problems. They don't call them a problem, but let, let's build a fort. Well, they've just created a scenario for themselves. Or let's make a bridge. And it's like a normal childhood playtime that that's kind of been taken away. What's next, do you ask? A mock panda habitat and urban farming. Because why not? <laughs> a group of volunteers in Westchester is following in those little footsteps, building beds for the kids in their community. In 2012, Luke Mickelson of Idaho saw a need for change in his community. So he picked up a saw, <laughs> built a bunk bed for kids who were sleeping on the floor in his neighborhood. We got wood together. We, we kind of uh, borrowed a, a plan from my daughter's bunk bed downstairs, and uh, we went out and built it. And come to find out, it was a lot of fun. Nine years later, Mickelson has grown what started out as a good deed into an international charity organization. Sleep in Heavenly Peace builds and distributes bunk beds from scratch for kids who are bedless which he says is a bigger issue than people realize. When we talk about child bedlessness, people don't know it's a really, it's a big problem and it's right next door. Sleep in Heavenly Peace now serves four different countries and has 250 chapters across the nation, one of which is right here in Westchester. The idea that we're able to come in and, and, and help improve situations for people um, is massive and we, we see, we feel it when we're, we're able to be in, in their homes and, and, and give a bed to these kids. Members of the Rye Chapter, along with other local volunteers, were all hands on deck at Deanna Friel Park in Rochelle to build 40 bunk beds for those in need across Westchester County with drills, saws, and sanders. Volunteers of all ages and experience levels out here doing their part to make a difference and put a smile on the faces of kids who need it most. There's nothing better than doing this. Uh, thinking about families who can benefit from the labor of love that we do here uh, really makes it all worth it. Nicholson says that last year was a slow one due to COVID, but the organization still managed to build and deliver over 20,000 beds across the country. This year, he hopes to double that number and live up to the charity slogan, no kids sleeps on the floor in our town. This next person in our spotlight is on fire, but somehow she keeps it cool when she's on the ice. Meet the Long Island born, trailblazing, phenomenal woman, Coach Barbara Williams. In one word, how would you describe your life? Fantastic. It's a typical Wednesday for Barbara Williams. You're pretty hard on these kids. I was lying to you. Oh, that was easy. Let's go, let's go, let's go! Too slow. You were just being nice with TV. Yeah. And while Barbara's helping her young students reach their potential, Miss Williams is anything but typical. When I tell you to stop, you stop. I'll never slow down. God gives me the talent, and I just go. In 1977, Barbara made history when she was named the Islanders official power skating instructor, becoming the NHL's first ever female skating coach. But not everyone was on board. There was only one player that didn't like me, I, and I'm not telling you who it was. The late, great El Arbor. He loved me. He said, she's going to help us win the cup. And they went, oh, yeah. But they did. One cup after another. Barbara was around for all of them. Her first student, Bobby Nystrom. She didn't take any back talk or anything like that from any of the guys. She stood right up to them and nose to nose, and she was tough, but that, that's what made her successful. When I watched Bobby Nystrom one morning, he was working on edges. I'm like, what the heck are you doing? Was he doing it right or wrong? Uh, he was doing some wrong, but mostly right. So I took everything I knew from figure skating and just changed it you know, to a hockey stance and it worked out well. Barbara has also written four books and says there's a movie in the works about her life. Who would you want to play you? The medium, Teresa Caputo. She not only looks like me and talks like me, she's so long on and she would kick their <laughs> in the movie. Whomever it is has their work cut out for them. Get in there! This next woman, Shaylee Gordon, works closely with the New York Roadrunners and she decided to co-create her own organization in Brooklyn and it hits pretty close to home. It's called We Run Brownsville. 
We Run Brownsville is made up of nearly 100 female runners and they all have a close bond. See, they coach each other through both their physical and their mental hardships that women experience every day. And then they empower each other so they can all keep moving forward. The group meets three times a week in Brooklyn and they hope to continue to expand. In this past year, this country has seen an increase in anti-Asian tax. Well, as Mr. Rogers once said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Well, we looked and News 12 found some helpers. Let's head to Bensonhurst where a senior center is offering itself up as a safe space. Majors Maureen and Ricky Key with the Salvation Army opened this community center in 2014. Its main function is giving older community members a space to socialize. But as reports of hate crimes rise against Asian Americans, the center is offering so much more. Come to our center and talk to us and share in what, how they feel. So that's the kind of the counseling and calm them down. So and make them happy. Maureen and Ricky are hoping this encourages dialogue between their members and local leaders to ignite change that'll help prevent future anti-Asian attacks. 